Good day, folks. This is Shane Hasty. Uh, for a change, I'm on the other side of the mic, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising podcast. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I am your host, back again, Jay Hersko. Joined with me, I have a murderer's row of guests. I have Todd Brash. This is Todd. Uh, no, hi. Man, this is going to be a long night. Uh, Andrew Leff. Hello. Stephen Kellogg. Cheers. Second episode of a double header, Mike Cadell. How are y'all? And joining us back, back from the dead. Mr. Mike McCallum, Mike, thanks for joining. Uh, thanks for having me back, guys. We are we are very excited to have you. So the topic of this week's episode is the Great Resignation. So this was actually prompted by Mike McCallum sent me an IM, and he said, "Hey, have you guys done anything talking about how everybody all of a sudden is changing jobs instantaneously?" And I said, "No, well, let's put together a show." So there's a lot of discussion around the Great Resignation. Is it real? Is it not? So let's test it wise so raw numbers 4 million people resigned from their jobs in july of 2021 4.1 million people resigned in august 2021 4.4 million resignations in september 10.9 million jobs are open at the end of july in the united states if the bls is to believed 20 million resignations total from may to september 2021 which is 15 percent higher than spring summer 2019 uh, resignations compared to 2020 levels are their highest in both healthcare, which is up 3.6%, and technology up 4%. Employees aged 30 to 45 are the greatest increase in the rate of resignation, up 20% from 2021. And it is this is not just uh, low-wage frontline worker bees. This is hitting CEOs as well. We have 103 new CEOs in the first half of 2021 compared to 49 new CEOs in the second half of 2020. So I'm going to start off with you, Mike McCalla. Why is this happening? Is it really people are having a moment and they're like, I should raise, I want to move to Montana and raise rabbits or what's going on here? I want to, I, I, I want to say, Jay, that it comes down to people wanting to work for a company that has the same principles and values of them and have a purpose and they want autonomy, but that's the agile hippie in me, right? I really, I really think my personal opinion is that the location um, restriction has been removed. Uh, and, and Mike, Adele, you, you totally stole my thunder um, in the beginning of this. And I know we weren't on yet, but um, removing that barrier has opened many opportunities for people. Um, and, and really, I do want to say, Yes, I have a new perspective of life, you know, COVID changed my life, but, you know, I really just think it's just a, a new opportunity for people. To, the pool of jobs is just exponential for knowledge workers, and um, I think they're taking advantage of it. Okay, okay. What do you think, Stephen Kellogg? Oh, and by the way, before I go too far into it, um, the reason why I convened the panel that we have is I think almost everyone here has changed roles in the last six months or so or has investigated a new role uh, or has a role change coming up. So this isn't just people speculating on the, on the way the world works. This is people who have actually made the, the change during this time. So Stephen Kellogg, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, so. Some of those numbers, I think, are more more obvious than others so when they talk about healthcare, i think i mean i have nurse friends who have just said i'm done i'm through nursing i'm out um they're not even moving on to other jobs at this point maybe at some point they'll they'll kind of catch their breath and get back to it but you know so some of those i think make sense i, I think the others are what most people are saying is it's the remote piece you know i i enjoy working remote so it also opens your opportunities to a lot more areas instead of just your physical, can I commute there? So. Good point. Good point. Um, Todd, let me ask you, what do you think? I mean, as someone who has changed jobs, like, like what, and when we get, when we go another round, we're going to go into like specifics, but what do you think in the aggregate? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of things I've got, I've got friends back home that keep talking about, 
the the unemployment benefits are higher than the the average salaries and people are making more money to not be employed and so they're gonna they're gonna kick back and chill and and, and make more than they could grinding it out for an unappreciative boss um so i mean that's i think that's something that's still alive and well out there um i think the location is is a big part of it now people can work remote i mean i've got friends that that work across town that that they can't fathom the idea of driving back across town now that they get to work from home and, <laughs> right. and so, a so, commute as small as that yeah yeah well as small i mean houston's houston's a big oh place. i know here we go so, with the texas shit they take no. six hours to drive from one side <laughs> to the other i know i know six long no uh. <laughs> no but i mean no, I'm, but i'm i mean i can you know people that would drive like an hour to you know across town no longer are doing that and and so that's a part you have some companies that are now forcing back to work or they're they're forcing back to roll you know I, i've got a i've got a buddy of mine that turned down a position because it was going to be more work no additional money and he was going to have to go into the office so i was like that's Ugh. that's 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 an interesting take for how to promote a to to, to sell a promotion so um it's it's weird but I mean, I think I think it's money, it's location, it's um, vaccine mandates, uh, remote. It's a whole lot. What do you think, Lef? And you so, are uh, there. We go. Yeah, I, I love this topic. I think it's it's great to bring this forward, and you know, we're reading a lot about it, but who's actually talking about it? So for me, you know, having recently changed, you know, companies only a couple months ago. I, it was getting back to simpler times, right? Like I'm spending a lot more time, I'm spending all my time at home with the people that live in my home. And I'm starting to kind of go back to what's important to me going through life is I'm never gonna work enough, I'm never gonna have enough money, but I'm always gonna have my family and I need to shift my priorities. And it, COVID actually woke me up in a different way to, to go back to, you know what? I actually enjoy being around the people that I live with. I actually have found new new experiences that I was ignoring before because I was on the road every week, right? Like 10 years of travel is is taxing. So getting back to that family first kind of mentality really woke me up in a different way to start exploring what opportunities would help me stay rooted in that as opposed to distracting me from not wanting to do that that's like left i love to hear that because it's it, it resonates personally um I, I put a post out on linkedin and i never thought it would get the traction that it did uh, but i was just, just hanging out one night and i'm like and this is why this resonates with me is uh i lost my mom when i was 22 my dad when i was 28 and i always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And guess what? I started my, my first company when I was 31, right? Because I knew, hey, man, it's too short, right? So it, it resonates with me what you just said, as well as like the pandemic for a lot of people was probably a true burning platform, right? Like you, you need that sense of urgency to change um, and really truly reevaluate your priorities in life. We all say we're going to do it, but it's not till just like, just like change management guys, right? Like mm -hmm. until it's, until it's real, until there's a sense of urgency, right? Until, you know, un, un, I mean, unfortunately we've lost some loved ones that we really reevaluate that. And man, that resonates left. And, and I do, I, I, I think a lot of people out there are, have made the move in the decisions that you have because of that. Um, you know, when we look at kind of the span of people changing jobs, I think there's a good percentage there that have that 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 lens. Um, and then I think there other the, there's a bigger portion there that lens has. Hey, I I I have more flexibility from a remote perspective. But, amen, buddy, amen. And, and just one thing to add to that, and I don't want to capitalize. You know, we we're going to dive deeper into this, but uh, thanks for sharing that, Mike. And I think too for me, it's it's. But I, I never wanted to be categorized as a professional success and a personal failure, right? So I, I struggled with that a lot as far as I could be extremely successful, but personally, I'm, I'm a complete mess. So finding a balance, COVID helped me understand how to balance that out differently. 
tell us. So I think there's an interesting piece too from the, the company's side, because I think some companies are realizing and embracing the remote and, and it's a, having an impact on their culture as well. And others are like, I can't wait to force you to come back in. And they're also feeling the squeeze of that. So where, where I was at my last company, I asked for a long time about working remote. And I was one of those that it was an hour and five minute commute on a good day, hour and a half often each way. That's a lot of time. And it was always, no, no, we need you in the office. Got to have you in the mm -hmm. office. Even if I'm telling you, you got to stay in your actual office and not talk to other people because you're going to distract them. Well, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> why am I here? Right. I can do this from home. And then COVID hit and we went remote and all of the numbers across the board went up for the stats they were tracking. So, so it's like, oh, so I mean, I, here, here's something but, that I can wait, hold on, Todd. Hold on, Todd. Mike, hit that. Hit that note. Yeah. So uh, there's a, um, a second or third order implication to something you just touched on. I'm curious to hear your perspective on. And um, it, this may go a little bit down the rabbit hole. Apologies. So we're digging remote. Um, I, have, I haven't commuted in four years. Um, but um, what are we losing by being remote? And at what point will that show up? and become uh, a barrier to whatever we need to do is knowledge, knowledge work thrives on collaboration and at what point yeah, you know, I, where I does think it, it's where a great point and, and I think that's part of where some companies are, are trying to find the okay well twice a week let's make sure we're all in but a lot of those I mean you can't do that all in because you hired me and I'm four states away it's not yeah. I can't be all in anymore Right. Yeah. So I do think there's some collaboration that's that's being lost, but I think we are also adapting to that. And, you know, in some ways, there's collaboration that happens that before would have been a, a 30 minute or an hour minute or hour long meeting that's now back and forth on Discord or Slack or whatever your chat of yeah. choice is. And it gets done. So yeah. I, I do think there's a blend on on the impact from that perspective. Yeah. And I gonna... think. Yeah. I think uh, I'm going to jump in Todd's spot real quick. I think balance, right? It's, it's again, too much of any one thing is it creates an imbalance. So I think now when we, I, I dislike working remote. I know I change jobs and all, but I dislike it. I, I feel like there's a, there's a quality in me that works better in front of people and with people as opposed to in front of a computer screen. So I think now I can appreciate it more when I have the opportunity and I feel mm. others, it's not just me, I'm feeling that from others. It's like, we long to be together. Now we appreciate when we have that opportunity because we've been in front of you know computers now for, for almost two years working remotely. So now that we can collaborate together in the same room, that's a big opportunity to, to kind of remember where we came from, honor where we are, and then really kind of yeah enjoy the time and you know breathing the same air together again uh, todd we cut you off before what were we gonna say um a, a couple of things so, you know so i came across somebody the other day that was saying that you know it was talking about hiring practices um and it goes back to a little bit of what of what mike and, and steven uh were talking about is that you know they felt that there just aren't any you know they they haven't or at least they haven't found the right tool to be able to collaborate effectively particularly in a a physical product development space. You know, they it's too hard to to ship out a bunch of, of samples and review it and get you know consensus and pull it back together. Um, and I've never worked in in that space, so I mean that's not really something that I can speak to. I mean, I, I know I've seen people that are developing products before and they've put it into to SolidWorks and 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 VR and they've literally walked through their product. To, to see how the, the, the renders and everything build. Um, but, you know, the, the, the collaboration piece in, in the physical space like that is, is or physical product is, is, you know, something I'm curious about. Um, but, and, and to, to, to Les comment, you know, for the, for the kind of work I do, I love being face-to-face -face with, with the team and can really, you know, but I've had to, I've, I've, I've changed you know, orgs and roles and have, have had to start working with people that I've never met before. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's working. So the, I, I haven't. And so, uh, you know, Stephen talked about an hour, an hour one way on a good day, an hour and a half. On a, on a typical day, um, I, I'm my employer was very very well set up for remote before we even before everything got locked down, and I actually luckily got transferred to full time remote work from home uh, in February right before everything locked down because it was kind of silly for me to spend an hour and a half commute one way to go into an office to sit on a webex with a bunch of people who were spread out across the country, right? That's right. just the sad reality of it, right? I mean, um, and then I would spend an hour and a half home. And then I would go walk around Philly for an hour at lunch. I would go to Dunkin' Donuts and before lunch and after lunch for coffee. And I, I, I think they're getting they're getting their, their pound of flesh out of me now. Um, but I do want to start with you, Mike, with this question because Left brought it up. The defense introduced it, Your Honor. Um, the idea of the consultant out on a Monday, back on a Friday, back on a late Thursday, is that? And Mike uh, Macau, I want to hear your thoughts as well, right? Because you help staff some of this stuff. Is that base? Is that idea dead? Is it dead or is somebody going to try and revive it? I think there will likely be some very small pockets of that kind of situation, but the large fleets of human beings uh, getting on the airplane on Monday morning is unlikely to, to come back. What, what I hope and pray we evolve to is instead of having you're in the office two days a week or you fly in on X day and out on Y day, is that we come together in person for interactions and events that are meaningful, kind of to, back to what what uh, uh, Left was saying. <clears throat> and um, those can be planned or unplanned. And, um, just enough, also, not just because. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And do it has to make sense. Arbitrary, you will be in the office these days, um, is really going that will likely sap people's intrinsic motivation. And it takes away the feeling of autonomy. And people are responding well because being able, uh, being remote, we have more autonomy, we have more control over some of the little things in our life. And to just you know have that taken away for have that removed in a way that doesn't make sense um, will you know generate a very visceral reaction. I think. What do you think, Lef? Um, I I hear what what Mike is saying, but I also think I do think it'll get back to some semblance of where it was. I don't think it'll be quite as intense, but I do think coming from big consulting, I think that they're chomping at the bit, right? That's that's a huge amount of revenue. It's a it's a change in the fundamental statement of work and the way that they bill. So I do think that things will swing back in the other direction at some point as restrictions get lifted and as companies figure out the liability of putting large teams <laughs> in the office, um, I think that that might might swing, the pendulum might swing back the other way. But I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope, again, companies are more balanced because it's, yeah. for those that have traveled, it it really, it's, it's life-changing. It affects everyone around you. So you talk about that hour and a half commute each way, that hour and a half lets you unwind to go home and hopefully focus on what you need to. I think that's also a challenge, right? I'm in my yeah. office, in my house, I walk out and I'm still aggravated at work, but now my family is part of that aggravation in the sense of I'm including them, right? Like they're not a separate entity. They're part of my work life now. Well, it's a, it, which, which is part good and bad. It, but yes. you, know, you know, left to, to that point, it was about... I don't know, six months ago when there was there was a talk about, you know, with, with the, the last place I worked, there was a talk about coming back to the office and everybody was talking about it. It's like, oh, you know, now that they weren't commuting, they were getting so much more done and, you know, they were always in meetings. And I, and I was like, well, wait a minute. I was like, if you're getting more done because you're not commuting, how many more hours per day are you actually working? And I was like, because, you know, you know, I mean, they were they were pretty pretty serious about us working eight hours and and over eight hours. It could wait till tomorrow, and I was like, well, 
are y'all guys are y'all working 10 11 12 hours now and and you know and just not logging it because it's easier to get stuff done and so you know i think there's some of that burnout now i, I agree that you know the commute for me i got to do things like listen to the podcast both ways and you know and kind of or tv or when i was riding the bus and unwind um but I, I don't know. I, I was so accustomed to to eight hours and being done that, you know, I I shut down the work machine and walk off and and I don't think anything more about it. I, I mean, I just flip a switch. Uh, I think Left brings up a good point though with the idea of unwinding, turning your brain off, right? Like, um, you know, Todd talked about well listening to the podcast while he was in his commute. Our numbers have gone down. And I guarantee you, everybody's have gone down. Part of that is because people aren't traveling. Part of that's because everybody and their mother now has a podcast. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but I do think that's that's part of it as well. Consumption has changed. Mike Cadell? Yeah, so I, I want to um, maybe uh, poke a little bit at something Left said a uh, uh, topic and a half ago. <laughs> the uh, you, you mentioned you know, the big consulting companies are chomping at the bit because the rev the um, operating model, the revenue, all that is founded on landing large teams of people on site. Um, to what extent will the buyers, the companies, um, be able to uh, push back on that? Because you know, if, um, you know, say, Jay's company is not bringing a bunch of people together in an office, will they say, you know, we're going to pay off, you know, the exorbitant travel? To have a bunch of you know brand X people come sit in an office and there's none of our people around to interact with them. Yeah, I think the quick, quick kind of bottom line response is I, I question the same thing. If we can prove that we can do it remote, why do we need to be on site? So we've proven the use case that we can evolve change and and still provide value. It's just it feels a little bit different. The user experience is different. So I I hope I'm like I said. I, I look for the balance. I think that this is a, a wake up call for everybody, or it has been. Be on site when it makes sense, when there's value to it. But Mike McCall looks like he's dying to say something. <laughs> Imagine that, right, guys? <laughs> um, so, my thoughts on on, on the whole uh, what Tuesday to Thursday thing, like Jason said, was basically it depends on the client, right? If the client's in the office, uh, they're going to expect you to be in the office. Right. If the client is saying, "Hey, it's cool to work remote," then guess what? There's no they'll see the efficiency and and tell you to stay home because guess what? They're not paying travel costs. So, and, context and that, is everything. And, and I was gonna say, and that's that's one of the things that I heard is like, why why would we send? And this was this was actually something that came up in a in an interview, you know, this summer for for somebody I didn't go to work for, but it was like why would why would we return to to 80 percent travel when most of the clients are going to be at home anyway and now if it's if it's i mean right i mean if it's that you know and and, and i said i could see like you know splitting the difference if you have that that you know every every 10 weeks you've got a big pi planning that they want to pull people together for then you may have two days of travel every you know quarter but not 80 percent every week i don't know well yeah, that's exactly yes. right. And and I don't want to sound like Mr. The Obvious, but context is everything. So if you're doing PI planning, yeah, it probably mm -hmm. makes sense to be, <laughs> you know, but like to make a blanket statement, like everyone must be here two days a week. Like, what's the value of that? Like, hey, maybe in the beginning of creating a new product, you're going to be asked to be there more because that's when collaborative ways of working and more in, not collaborative ways of working, but more in in-person ways of working will be more beneficial, right? Um, so, you know, making those blanket statements, what these people want, um, I actually saw an article today, um, is is really, I, I think I said, like the zoom in on knowledge workers, right? 57, 57%, and this is in fortune, uh, this was on fortune.com, 57% are looking for new jobs in 2022. Um, and 93% just want more flexibility. And so I think that's that's that says a lot. I definitely think that says a lot. Um, I think um, I well, I also think putting it in the company's perspective, right? Like this whole idea of the great resignation. I mean, let's be real here. I have I know plenty of people. Some of them, some of them are mutual friends, where they've said, 
I've been looking around and I have companies throwing money at me to do basically the same job I'm doing now, still being remote, but they can't find anybody good. Or they, they or they they've had people leave, right? And here's the other thing where companies are honestly, most big major companies are shooting themselves right in the foot. If you're worried about a particular person leaving, a particular type of person leaving, if they're gonna get another 30 grand on the open market, give them 25. Because you're going to spend that 30 in the next person you hire. If I leave right now, Steven's going to come in behind me. He's going to be looking for that rate plus 30. And then the HR costs, the onboarding costs, all that other BS. If you like the people that you have, here is the chance to show it, to give them something, to say, hey, you know, we realize you're important. We realize everybody's running around. We want you to stick around, and here's a token of our appreciation. And it's it's kind of silly how little gestures like that, not even 25 grand can go a long way. It can go a long way. So one of the things you were talking about was, um, Lev was talking about how he likes, he feels like a, uh, a better person when he's uh, in front of people. And the whole idea of sending everybody home remotely, right? Maybe we swung the pendulum too far. There was just an article that came out about, um, I know this is a middle school, but knowing some of the emotional intelligence of some of the people we all work with, I don't think a middle school is too far off as a parable. Um, there was a middle school in Oregon that has actually paused in-person classes. They have paused in-person classes due to, quote, students struggling with the socialization skills necessary for in-person learning. So think about that for a second. Right. Now, granted, these are middle school kids. They're children. Right. Um, And we're not going to debate the political expediency pluses and cons of the lockdown. But these are children who are having trouble getting back to the scheme of things. Right. Getting back into the swing of things. Um, I if we think of the general makeup of the people that we work with in knowledge work. Right. There are a lot of introverts. There are a lot of people who don't do well with with groups. And now we're sending them home, you know, and then we're going to say, oh, well, now you need to come back into the office. That's kind of jarring, right, Stephen? Yeah, that's a great job. I got that written down, Jay. Honestly, <laughs> like when these guys got to go home and work from their home office, they were like, "Oh my god, I don't need to talk to people like face to face." Like, because the nature of the work is right. Like the nature yeah. of the work is, is like they are introverts, right? And so I definitely think that plays a part of it. The one thing that I'll hit home on that was a great point of yours is put it the other way. We keep saying that everybody has now this big opportunity, more opportunities than they ever had because of remote work. What about the organizations hiring the talent? Absolutely. All they have to do is adapt their policies and process, and now their pool gets much wider, right? Yep. And that's a game. That's a game changer, man. That is like a competitive advantage. So, hey, hopefully, ho- companies are taking advantage of that, right? The, o- the only last thing I'll say there is like, it depends how much you trust your people, right? You, do, do you really, do you care about being on site every single day, right? Or do you just really have that so, culture of trust? So I'll talk a little bit to that because I know some of the clients, when we went remote, they started saying, oh, well, we want to get, you know, tracking software to figure out what the people are doing. And God, is this the my, Barclays belly button laser that they rolled out in the UK? And my, <laughs> <laughs> and my response was, do you know what you expect out of this position? Yes. Are they delivering that? Yes. Then why do you need to spend time, money, and somebody trying to monitor that to figure out if they're working or not? So back to your point, it's part of that is a trust factor, which is if I see you in the office, keep in mind, I'm assuming you're working. How many <laughs> people are actually doing that that's a big assumption long, right that's a big assumption with some of the people i've come but across because i can't right? see you sitting in the office and you may actually be using the bathroom i don't know because uh, i don't use the bathroom when i'm at work i, I mean the logic there just kind of slips for me for it, i don't understand it mm-hmm. well, a couple Steven. things i do want to also bring up though real quick um Part of it, I think, when you are working remote is, is shifting your mindset and adapting for things that you used to do. So I've recommended to a lot of people, hey, you used to listen to podcasts on your commute. Spend 30 minutes at the start of your day listening to a podcast. Listen to a podcast while you're fixing breakfast or out walking the dog where you used to wait until you got in your car. So there's things you can adapt. And I also, I love the fact that I can say, hey, you know what? It's whatever time, one o'clock, I'm going to go 
take the dog out back and sit for 30 minutes and actually enjoy the outside and get some sun on my face. And did I do that at my last job? No, I might walk across to a restaurant, pick up food and bring it back. So yeah, I think there's definitely some extra benefits now. I can actually go downstairs and oh, spend 15 minutes talking to somebody because they're excited about something that just happened. Great, mm -hmm. let's talk about it. Doesn't kill the day, doesn't kill my productivity. I'm still working. So if anything, it makes you a happier employee, Absolutely. right? Because you get that 15 minutes. Of I mean, during the summer, my thing was every day for an hour, I would log off, I would go sit outside with a book and the dogs. And it was just a nice change. And you know, not to, you know, we were joking before we started about how I have like a whole herd of animals here. Um, and not to be morose, but there were times when I was working down in Wilmington, right, where I would come home and I'd lose a pet. Or I'd come home and it would be somebody sick, right to the vet, and that's the end of it, right? And I thought about the day before where I spent eight hours at work and then four hours in the car. And I, now I get to spend a little bit more time with my wife, but ugh, we'll, we'll talk about that one later. Um, I don't know how divorce lawyers were essential when we locked down, but we'll continue. Um, but I, you do get to appreciate your pets. I mean, as funny as that sounds coming from me, but your pets, your loved ones a little bit more because you get to see them more. You know, like, I mean, I actually have to talk to my wife now because I, but I go upstairs, I feed the dogs, I make dinner, we sit down, it's like 6.30 when we're done, and I'm like, you want to, like, talk about some? Okay, well, let's talk about some. How about them Knicks, you know? But it's, it's a different world. It's a, it's a yeah. different world. It was, that conversation wasn't about the Knicks. No, 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 no. <laughs> But, you know, Stephen, where, where I used to be, you know, like for, when I first started, there was a guy that you could hear snoring in his cube, like three cubes over. And he he survived there a long time with a lot of naps, like midday. So, you know, you know, you know, whether you're whether you're but in the office point. and sleeping or or, or at remote and working, I mean, go on, go yeah. on, Mike Cadell. Yeah. So, again, just to kind of offer a somewhat uh, contrary perspective to, to simulate some thought. Um, I agree. I, 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 right there with, with you, you know, it's, it's awesome to be able to have that, you know, a 10 or 15 minute break and share something with somebody who lives in the house with me. Um, absolutely love that. <clears throat> to what extent are we losing connection with our coworkers because we don't have the opportunity to also share with them not in place of but also you know you get on slack yeah, I, or teams or whatever it's, I, is it quite the same no yeah so i think there's a couple things there though and maybe this is a whole different show on how to adapt but one thing i do is i throw a hey i'm going to be at lunch and i send an invite out to everybody in the company now my company right now is super tiny but i did it at the last place too hey i'm going to be on lunch here's the, the invite to zoom or well, we use teams here but Here's the invite and people showed up and we just chat for an hour eating lunch. And some people are kind of working while they're chatting and some people are eating. So there are ways to adapt. Is it the same? No, but I mean, it's, it's better than not. A, a thing that's interesting to me in my job, which is somewhat similar to my last job, but it's basically consulting with the sea levels. And it's in my last job, it was all phone call based. So I'd set up a meeting and it was phone call paced. For me, it's a huge advantage now because now all those calls have turned into Teams meetings calls. So I actually see the person, whereas I didn't before. So I, I now make a better connection with my clients than I did before. Now, granted, before we started working remote at the last company, we were going on site once a quarter or whatever to actually meet with the people. And I assume at some point for some clients that will resume, but yeah. That, that's an yeah. interesting flip that's happened where it's for me it's gone from voice to actual video with my clients yeah that's so, a, that's an interesting interesting uh, point left uh, wait a minute. hold on thrash left all right <laughs> so i i go back to the psychology of things for some reason so to me i always thought that i was two different people right i had the work version of me and then i had the home version of me but i couldn't be the home version of me at work and vice versa. So I feel that that line has been blurred. So now I am showing up at work and at home as the same person, which to me has been beneficial for me. And I think it, it, it's something that I've always thought about is what happens when you walk through the door at work 
that changes your mind to behave a certain way that you wouldn't behave that way at home. And I found is that your your new uh, employment situation versus your being at home. It, so it's forced me to to address that and be very self aware that that was actually an experience that it was a blind spot for me because I never saw it that way until I wasn't that way or until I had to address it differently. So I feel that I've created a healthier version of myself due to, and that's how I've had to evaluate leaving a company is what's my future like? Does this help support this, ver this new version of me that I like better? Or does this hurt that? And do, will I revert back and have a relapse into where I was? Interesting. Which is probably another podcast. But I mean, because I think that, you know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more awareness now about personal need yeah. and about family. And so, you know, part of that, I think is, is there are a lot of people experiencing what you've gone through, right? Where it's okay, now I am actually, I can bring myself to work because I'm at my house. It is me. And, and so there's that, that blend that's happening. And I think that's part of the whole psychology of why things are changing and i think that's a driver in as well as to the whole quote-unquote great resignation todd yeah so i want to go back to something that 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 steven was saying a minute ago because it's something that i hear come up a lot so he was talking about going from from phone calls to team video calls well so when we were all in the office for for those of us unlike cadell that were you know have actually you know been, been office dwellers for a while we would have meetings all the time where we're face to face and now uh, i mean you know people would act like you just you know nailed their foot to the floor literally if if you try to get you know a you know, video on and it's like you know oh well you know they feel like they have to be you know present and paying attention I'm like that's what we did sitting around conference tables but you know somehow that's that now seems to be this 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 big deal when you're going to be on video for 15 to 60 minutes versus you know yeah. eight hours of of, of potential face-to-face -face. it's because they're going to have to change out of their pjs and <laughs> no you don't you put the camera from put, the neck up put their little man bun up you know <laughs> mike goodell and um todd I, i've experienced the same kind of uh feedback from folks that i've been working with in the last 18, 20, whatever number of months it is. And <clears throat> I, I, I believe, hypothesis, a contributing factor to that is that um, being on camera by, by video, you know, Zoom, Teams, whatever, is more work mentally, psychologically, and emotionally than being present in a room because in a room you've got uh, awareness of the full room all at once and you can see the subtle nonverbals like you know I can see you know uh, Jay you know giving uh, left a sideways look when I say something's totally you know random and silly <clears throat> that you can't get that on on video and also uh, if you're like me and you've got you know you're a masochist and you've got your self view on all day looking at yourself all day is something you don't do in person so that contributes to it, doesn't explain it all. There's, a, I think you, you hit on something, Todd, there's a change in expectations. And some people just, you know, would prefer not to have to be quite that present. I mean, You're looking at me like I'm a wacko. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, 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 I'm sitting here thinking about all the, the, the previous episodes I've recorded where the peanut galleries picked on me because... You know, when I don't have the virtual background on, it's the the shelves over my laundry room that you know over my washer and dryer that everybody likes to to comment on because you know I'm I'm in a I'm in a small house I'm in a small space and uh, but the but the other side been, of that Todd yeah. the other side of that is again you know people who don't like to turn their video on and this is an entire whole podcast episode in and of itself right we have been with each other virtually for eighteen months right yeah. we have seen each other without haircuts. We have seen each other without going to the dentist. We have seen each other without shaving faces. Jesus, the beard that I grew, the wife of every... If I ever tried to do that again, the divorce papers will be on the desk, right? But my point being is 
whether we liked it or not, we developed a level of comfortability with each other out of necessity. And it would be a shame to let that fall, fall by the wayside. Right. Like, you know, you joke about, you know, you, your um, fake background. So we can't see like the laundry detergent in the WD-40. Right. That's kind of it kind of adds personality to these situations. Right. Like I never t- I always have my camera on and I never turn a virtual background on because I want you to see all the, the books I'm, I'm not reading that I'm stressed that I haven't gotten through yet. Or like one of my idiot cats like swinging off the shelf behind me. You know, what I mean, that's the kind of thing that adds a little bit of color to the fact that we're locked in the house staring at each other at a web screen. So I'm going to ask the uncomfortable question because I'm not really sure how everybody's going to answer it. Does salary have anything to do with people resigning? You know, we always we always say, oh, there's no such thing as theory X people. I'm going to call bullshit. There are some of us that we are going to jump because of money. So does salary have something to do with it? Mike McCallum, start with you. Up to a certain extent, right? You know, if if you're if you're a junior developer or whatever it may be, and you have an opportunity to up your salary you're going to do that but i think i do get the fact that once you're financially stable it is about in my personal opinion it it is about kind of fulfilling those personal needs right um so yeah jay money always counts right um and totally get it but i do think there is like kind of that certain level of okay now we're stable um you know, I'm comfortable with, with, you know, the healthcare and all that really important stuff um, that it, 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 it comes down to a little personal decision. And I think, I think giving that kind of burning platform of the pandemic and people losing people, I think that brings that back into perspective. Like, Hey, we're making just enough money for us to be happy. And I think that, 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 that mm. this whole thing brought pe- that back into perspective. Lef, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I, I do think that, yes, it's it's kind of like if you go with the used car market, right? Like everyone's selling a car right now because the market's so hot. Same with the housing market. Everyone is trying, you know, the inflation of things. So yeah, money has is definitely, I always want to make more money. I don't always need to make more money. But so I think that's, again, striking that understanding what you're signing yourself up for with that higher price tag, or are you doing the same job just for more money? So uh, money, money is a, you know, I'm not, I hate to say it. It's almost shameful, but it's a motivator. I mean, I, yeah. it, so yeah, I I, you the, need to eat. Yeah. The only thing that I would throw out though, is based on the context of the podcast, I don't know that money is, is increasing the resignation shift rate. Mm-hmm. The, the only way point. that I, the only way that I think it, it could be is that potentially companies that have now said hey we're gonna go remote which means we've just set our footprint to the u.s let's say versus my own little raleigh area um there may be money drivers there because now i can pay somebody more who's in a a lower spot so for them that could be a motivator during this time i can work remote and make more money great but in general, I don't think we're seeing a spike in it because of money. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a fair statement. Um, I also think if I'm a world class Angular guy in Des Moines, right now at this point with the way things have changed, I'm not necessarily stuck with earning a Des Moines salary. You know, like I can find somewhere who will pay me for right. my skills because right. everybody everybody else in their office is remote. And to Mike McCalla's point, right, the companies that that seize on this the intelligent way, they don't they don't just throw the pendulum because they start to think, okay, let's if we're gonna pay two hundred something grand a year for a senior agile coach who has portfolio experience, let's get the best one we can find, not just the one in our market. And that I think is you're gonna see a greater dispersion of talent, and maybe we see more wells of talent popping up in more odd places. Because there are people who are now, you know, a company that has a has a reputation as as, as stodgy, right? And and old, like uh, let's use the common example, right? Old school banking and finance, right? Maybe all of a sudden out of nowhere they disrupt themselves because they're willing to give it a shot to just try and great find great talent. And Mike, I, can I, I do, cut you off? I do wonder if they're gonna if that's gonna balance out though. 
if there's a way that companies are going to start paying based on location versus based on where their yeah. their office is, right? So, some companies have brought that up and they've gotten raked over the coals about it a bit, you know, trying to cost a living, adjust yeah. their salaries. And someone's like, you know, I want to make California money and, and live in Tijuana and I should be but able to a do lot, that. A lot of companies still do that. I mean, I went through a bazillion interviews and I was amazed at the swing in salary ranges based upon. So if I used my PA address, the salary was way different than the Texas address, right? Yet uh, living in both places, the cost of living is not that significantly different. Right. So, Except for your electricity. <laughs> yeah, and water. <laughs> oh, my yeah. Lord. Left water, moves, left water moves to Texas, the and they have a once-in-a-lifetime winter storm where they lose <laughs> power, and then, like, locusts. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, I want to throw, I, oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, you can yeah, go ahead, Mike. There's another dimension to the salary dynamics that would be easy to, to overlook, I think. And that is that um, as there's more activity in the market, call it churn, whatever you choose, um, that's it's making uh, it more of a seller's market than a buyer's market. And uh, that's inflating wages uh, or salaries a bit. And um, so as a result of that, companies are that are, to, to Mike McCall's point, if, if you're an enlightened company and you're um, compensating people fairly for their value, then you'll be able to attract good talent. Other companies are having to overpay because their environment sucks, and that's the only way they can get people to come. So there's, you know, there, there's market forces, if you will, at, at work there and um, you know, hopefully it's kind of like the supply chains where um, in not too long a time, things kind of reach a rational point again. But, you know, who knows? You bring up you bring up an interesting point, Mike, and this is another episode. I wish I could write these things down to remember to have them. For those listeners who are maybe younger, um, the idea of golden handcuffs do exist, especially in what we do. They exist. The idea of working at a place which pays me so well that I really can't afford to leave, even though maybe the culture was bad or toxic or I, I have hit a glass ceiling, that definitely exists in corporate America. And it and it's kind of, it's great when they give you that money on the way in, but it's terrible year five. And I'll just, I'll leave that at but, that. That's a different different episode for a different where, time. Where I, where I just left, you know, people were like, good for you. I wish I could leave. They were, they, they were, they yep. were shackled. So, um, but, but on the topic of, 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 you know, compensation for moving, I mean, I mean, in general, you know, most people say that they, you know, the only way to get the, the next bump that they want is by moving. Right. So I don't know that that's necessarily, you know, exclusive to the great resignation thing, except that at the same time, I started to see a big, you know, pay swing for scrum masters. I mean, the, the, the average was starting to go up you know, 10, 15, $20,000 a year, um, which percentage wise was, was pretty big. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think it's a little of column A, a little of column B for some of the shuffle right now. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's on the company though, right. To, to make those adjustments internally and see where the, where the, where the market's going. I don't see it in the staffing side of things. I don't see that. I don't see them making those adjustments based off of, the market demand and rates, right? Um, so that's that's fair, but I, I think it's the companies have to be able to adapt to that, that. And if they do, then you're they should be able to keep their people by engaging them and making sure that they're making the market standard, right? So I think that's what happens. Like people, companies don't engage people. They don't. They don't necessarily know what they're struggling with or what they want so guess what they jump um and they leave and man the the cost of uh you know of attrition is is significant and i I just think companies companies have to start looking at that um because it's it is really significant that learning curve and when you really start running the numbers it's like listen we need to engage our people our best people can't walk out the door because if they do, we're in deep shit. 
and, you know? and to Which that is point, a Mike, great, hey, manager topic. Yeah, right? I mean, truth be told, the first people that leave are your most talented people who have options, right? They're the ones who are hovering by the exits. And what you're left with is not something you can base continued growth upon. And I'm not making fun of lifers or insulting people who are long tenured, right? Because I am at the longest (laughs) tenure I've ever had in my professional career in my current job, right? Um, But the people who leave are the people who have options. And then to your point, maybe this is the one big thing that companies should take away is, it is much cheaper to give such and such a raise and a promotion than it is to try and fill that role in a hot market. And then the HR spend, the recruiting spend, the productivity wasted while you're trying to go through six different interviews. It's, it adds up super fast. And I guarantee you. In comparison yeah, to the lost thing, opportunity cost yeah. of not having that talent engaged. In a yep. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that resonated with me, what you just said was, People are leaving because they have options. Well, guess what? The remote work just created Mm -hmm. a A shit ton of options. options. Absolutely. And I know a lot of the articles you see now are are around the, you know, hey, it's not about having a ping pong table and a foosball table and free lunch anymore. You know, this is this has definitely shifted shifted things to make more options. I don't need a foosball table to play with Jay at work because I'm at home. Right, right. I got, I got my Xbox right there. Call of Duty. I'm looking at the loading screen. I can squeeze in another match in between this meeting. I did see a snarky post on LinkedIn where it was an infographic about you know the the top eight things that employees look for, and it's like culture, compensation, engagement, feeling of belonging, feeling of purpose, blah blah blah. And then the person put at the bottom, nowhere does this say free pizza. I saw so that one. you know yeah. companies need to get. Yeah. Get to get it together. Free pizza is not, it's not a selling point anymore. I, I left a company that catered lunch for us every day, somewhere different, you know, all sorts of options, but you know, there was, there was more money and better opportunity somewhere else. Yeah. I do uh, think, uh, I do think as far as the ex- expanding back out and people flying and doing all that, there are certain things that are starting to pick up like trade shows I'm starting to see more and more people talk about, oh, it was so great to get back out to the trade show and do a do a conference speech and blah blah. So there's still that ment- mentality and that that drive of people to do that, and I I think that's going to be the first kind of on ramp to more in person and and more travel. You think that's the canary, Stephen? The 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 Vegas tour bo- uh, Vegas conference bookings because they've been publishing those numbers every month. Right, like it's without conferences, Vegas kind of just withers in the desert. But I, no yeah, I think that's part of the drive, right? The people who made money off the conferences are are pushing, hey, we can do this now, and people are starting to do it. And there's there's a crowd of people that that's somewhat their life, you know. It's hey, I, that's what I do. I go to conferences. I'm so glad they're opening up, and they're gonna roll back into that. The people who haven't made the shift, like left, who have, you know had a an epiphany of wow life actually is something i i can i can do two pieces of that must be the, the airplane mechanics employed though <laughs> <laughs> yeah he does i'm oh, just my lord left. i'm happy he found it you know he, he, yeah. in texas in texas no less you know you had to get out <laughs> of jersey or pa wherever the hell you are right <laughs> to Delaware Valley. Why would he leave yeah, Delaware yeah. Valley go to Austin? At, and at, and at when the Barclays, brings that you know. once in a century storm where they had like thirteen thousand dollar electric bills and they're they're setting their house on fire just to keep warm. We don't need that West Wing, y'all. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close out with this. Um, if uh, and I'm gonna go around the horn. So if someone is in the sound of our voices and they're thinking about maybe maybe making a leap, maybe maybe. Maybe they're either looking, starting to look, or they've got an offer in their hands. If you could offer them one piece of advice um, in the general context of what we've been talking about tonight, what would it be? And I'm going to start with you, Mike Cadell, because you look like you got an answer. Sure. I mean, I've always got something to say, whether it's relevant or not. Um, (laughs) What I would say to that person is to pause for a moment and think about what genuinely makes you happy, what motivates you, what 
brings joy to your life um, and how this new situation fits into that picture. Not necessarily that it's the thing that gives you joy, but how does this thing fit? <clears throat> and um, it's uh, there's a, an adrenaline rush and an ego rush when somebody says, hey, I want you to come work for me. And, um, uh, you know, take that compliment, but also think about how, you know, what will this be like? What do I value? How does this um, correlate to that? As an example, uh, recently uh, a firm approached, approached me about taking on a consulting assignment next year. And I was talking with my wife about it. And <clears throat> the term I used was, they are offering stupid money. It was like a 60% bump over current bill rate. And she looked at me and she said, you be a, you know what, fool <clears throat> to take that because you're going to be miserable. And I honestly don't want to be you to be around and be miserable like that. <laughs> I don't want to deal with you that way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, so just I understand, to, you know, and, and take the compliment because it is a compliment, but um, think about what will, how it will be for you. What make, what truly makes you happy and, and how does this different situation uh, relate to what makes you happy? And uh, also, you know, you know, sometimes you gotta, you know, uh, suspend disbelief and say, "Yeah, you know what? I'm going to give this a go," and yeah. uh, you know, take a chance. So. There, we, fair enough. Fair enough. Stephen Kellogg. Um, so it's hard to follow that one. Um, I do think a couple of things I would I would say is you know. Uh, Again, don't look at it as just the money. What is this doing for your career as a long as a long goal? What are you looking to accomplish from a career standpoint? And is this actually a stepping stone in the right direction for that? Um, so that would be one. The other would be, hey, once you make the decision, fully embrace it. Don't second guess yourself. Just do it. If you've accepted or you're going to accept, accept it, move on, put yourself into it. And it's not a permanent decision. So yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Todd Thrash. So I went remote and changed roles after I did that, and and I didn't know how that would work out, and it turned out it worked out very well. So I would say that for someone doing it, look at the the pros and cons of of how you worked in the office versus how you're working now, and what that change would look like, and if. If it looks like all things being equal, it's going to be better than than I would say go for it, um, but but do the due diligence and you know for for how everything looks with where you are versus what you're looking at. Um, I'm I'm happy I did it though. Andrew Leff. Yeah, so Cadell kind of stole my thunder, but I totally agree. And something that that I work with clients and, and I do a, quite a bit of mentoring now even, and I'm working with mentees on it is it, something we, we used in Forsk is a force field analysis, right? So it, what, what makes you happy, right? Write down the things on your values and then evaluate making a job hop or a move. How does that complement those sound bites or how does it aggravate them? So, and are you okay with saying, I'm willing to compromise on these things because I want these things. So having that conversation and dialogue, not only with yourself, but the people around you, because it does change you as a person as well, when you're under a lot of stress or whatever it might be. I think it's important to know what your values are and what you're willing to compromise and, and have that, bring that to your family or be okay with it to, with yourself. So really having that internal dialogue to me is, is really critical and write it down and really map it out and, and, and look at it and believe it. All right. All right. And last thoughts, take us on Mr. McCalla. Yeah. Um, thanks guys. Great perspectives um, from definitely from the employee's perspective. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a employer perspective, right? And, and Jay, you're the one that kind of triggered these thoughts in me is that please, employers need to use this opportunity right, to their advantage, right? Don't, don't defend against it. Be very offensive and, and act on it because eventually everybody will, right? It's just like agility, 
use it to your competitive advantage. Don't resist it. Know that it's real and adapt to it. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity here for employers to really get awesome talent. And so embrace that. Make, take advantage of it and, and trust your employees because, yeah, the, all they want is, and God, I sound cliche, but autonomy and purpose purpose right like they really want to be part of it so that's it perfect perfect and and andrew left provided a nice closing <clears throat> bon mot in the chat where he said you know treat people as good on the way out as you did on the way in <clears throat> it speaks wonders to you it speaks wonders to your character um and it really does pays it pays dividends forward so uh on behalf of all of our listeners i want to thank mike mike Stephen, andrew and todd on behalf of all of us on this panel, we want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in once again. If you like what you heard, please give us a review, a rating, a listen on podcast, Podbean, Spotify, Amazon podcast, your podcasting host of choice. It does help other people find us. Um, please get in on the conversation in our Discord server. It's quite vibrant. It's quite wild. We have quite a lot of people talking all day. I think believe, I believe today's discussion earlier was the difference between user story mapping and breadth versus depth decomposition. And we went, we went down the rabbit hole on that one. So um, please hop in. Uh, I also want to give a shout out and thank you to the artist Krebs. Uh, shout out to Philly and Chris at Machine Man Records who provided our outro music free of charge. And lastly, we are committed to always being free for all of our listeners and all of our contributors. However, we do have a Patreon if you would like to help offset hosting and production costs. And who knows, you might get a surprise package from me in the mail. And yes, it will be work appropriate. So once again, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast.